should be live now. Uh, hello, hello everyone. Welcome to the second episode of our essay slash interview uh, analysis and discussion. Um, today we're going to be looking at an interview with Aldous Huxley. Um, anyone that's seen our discussion of Brave New World, it's going to be quite informative if you've seen that or if you've read it. But as an addendum to that discussion, we wanted to take a look at this interview with him. Um, joining me today, I've got Rupert August. Hello. I've got Brandig. Good afternoon. And I've got Freelance. Good evening. Um, I don't think there's really anything to cover before we just jump straight into it and just play the video. And anyone that wants to stop it and make any comments, just let me know and we can we can go from there, I think. Certainly. Okay. Let's make sure it's actually at the beginning. This is Aldous Huxley, a man haunted by a vision of hell on earth. A searing social critic, Mr. Huxley, 27 years ago, wrote Brave New World, a novel that predicted that someday the entire world would live under a frightful dictatorship. Today, Mr. Huxley says that his fictional world of horror is probably just around the corner for all of us. We'll find out why in a moment. The Mike Wallace Interview, presented by the American Broadcasting Company, in association with the Fund for the Republic, brings you a special television series discussing the problems of survival and freedom in America. I just uh, want to jump in real quick that... Uh, it's really interesting to point out the, uh, the the change in journalism and journalistic standards over the years that this was a prime time interview um, versus what we get for modern prime time uh, discussion nowadays with the talking heads and the round table and the uh, the nothing but sound bites. Yeah, I, I I have to try and balance it in my head as to whether or not I'm looking at it through rose tinted glasses. But I do look at this kind of interview and think, you know, that it's so much classier <laughs> than just the talking head punditry that we get now. Um, maybe it's just an aesthetic thing, but uh, to me, it seems like two gentlemen having a conversation, and the interviewer is actually listening to what's being said, taking it on board, and then responding and <laughs> you compare that to now where it's just what can we get a three second sound bite out of um mm -hmm. you know th this kind of interview technique and, and this kind of procedure is only really found now on you know online discussion really um you know with the increased popularity of podcasts and things like that yeah, the, the long form interview yeah you're never going to find this on tv <laughs> Well, you could say that that's a pressure of um, one of the things that he was that he ends up talking about. Um, spoilers, I suppose, uh, in that oh. the the methods of sort of propagandizing and uh, and communicating have been hind, honed rather uh, to such a degree that um, they can they can much more perfect it and uh, and try to fit as much of that that single moment that you actually want to hear, or at least your subconscious wants to hear, um, and then cram all of that into a, a very tight space. Yeah. Oh, there's. There's some background noise going on somewhere. Oh, my apologies. Um, yes, yeah. So the media and the the format in which they're they're actually having this discussion on is, is <laughs> has been actually taken and been used as part of the of the propaganda that he's about to speak about. Um, yeah. So this is a much more simplified, sort of stripped down form of of what the uh, what the product actually is, which is effectively still the same. I would I would probably say. Mm -hmm. In the same way that you can look, you can look at um, pure advertising and how that's changed over time. Where previously it might have been just, um, I suppose, this, I suppose we're doing the same thing now. But where, where you just take a an image or an idealized image of the product and, and present that with some, um, you know, some hyperbolic words uh, about how good it is, and, and that's basically your advertisement. Whereas now there's a lot more of a a lot more science that goes into it, I suppose. Getting getting the lighting exactly right and, on on everything, and the the different camera angles, and you know, yeah, yeah. There's a lot more money and effort and thought that's gone into it now, so we've managed to bring it to much more of a fine art. 
yeah, science shield, would actually probably shield be off better. anything that could be accidental, and everything that you're left with is is pure intentional. Uh, every aspect of it is 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 there for a reason. Yeah, uh, I, I remember that in the uh, the mid '80s there were still interviews like that, where you just had one interviewer spending half an hour to an hour with a guest and just asking them, and then and having these these long form discussions as you have nowadays with a Joe Rogan and and people would watch that and people would talk about that the next day at the water cooler uh, well now it's like yeah we have to react right now and it's uh, this political opinion and we just have to have our confirmation bias because otherwise you wouldn't be watching this channel it's just to get people hooked until the next commercial block and uh, well that's part of the other problem as well actually the uh, the market pressures uh, yeah. which, which mean that you can't just rely on uh, you know Roughly, let's say twenty percent of the uh, television viewing population watching this. You know, if you were to, if it was all to split equally, because there's only five channels. Say mm -hmm. now you can change to whatever channel you like, or even switch medium much more much more readily. Um, so you've got to be able to hold somebody's attention. So, much, so you would say better. you would say that that modern modern television is more like the uh, TV equivalent of clickbait. Uh, so before you had time to read a newspaper and now you just have the time to read the headline in the first paragraph on every online article you see. And then a CNN is the uh, the interview equivalent of that. Like, okay, yeah. we have these really short interviews and and already the message is kind of decided already. And if the and if not, then the interviewer will, will basically correct the message of the person who's interviewed. Yeah, same phenomenon. Competing yeah, in, the, uh, in the information economy, not the information, well, the information and attention economy, I should say. Yeah. Not not to get caught on this, as we even we haven't even uh, let him speak yet. But uh, <laughs> even the even the medium in in which we still expect a long form commentary has been infested with this kind of popcorn bite sized um, talking head snapshots, where you know something like a presidential debate is you. People still have this image of it being this kind of discussion where it's classy, a formal event where people thoroughly discuss their ideas. But no, it's just it's just uh, <laughs> excrement throwing, uh, basically. It's become a bit of a game show. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, let's, uh, let's carry on. Tonight's guest, Aldous Huxley, is a man of letters as disturbing as he is distinguished. Born in England, now a resident of California, Mr. Huxley has written some of the most electric novels and social criticism of this century. He's just finished a series of essays called Enemies of Freedom, in which he outlines and defines some of the threats to our freedom in the United States. And Mr. Huxley, right off the bat, let me ask you this, as you see it, who and what are the enemies of freedom here in the United States? Well, I don't think you can say who in the United States. I don't think there are any sinister persons deliberately trying to rob people of their freedom. But I do think, first of all, that there are a number of impersonal forces which are pushing in the direction of less and less freedom. And I also think that there are a number of technological devices which anybody who wishes to use can use to accelerate this process of going away from freedom, of imposing control. Well, what are these forces and these devices, Mr. Hudson? I should say that the, uh, there are two main impersonal forces. Uh, uh, the first of them is not exceedingly important in the United States at the present time, though very important in other countries. Uh, this is the force which in general terms can be called overpopulation. The, the mounting pressure of population pressing upon existing resources uh, a, is an extraordinary he's, he's, this this feels like the um the malthusian trap that he basically starts like we have an overpopulation and of course the resource to be limited yeah it, without a doubt it yeah. is yes but he'll he will justify it a little bit better uh, a little bit better later uh, and give some evidence for it so um let's yeah. kind of hold on to that point i think yeah, yeah. but as we covered previously, as we know, his circle, his brother was particularly in those circles where Malthusianism was uh, <laughs> alive and kicking. Um, but yes, he does justify it in a slightly different way, which is more accurate. Ordinary thing. Something is happening which has never happened in the world's history before. 
I mean, let's just take a, a simple fact that between the, the time of the birth of Christ and the landing of the Mayflower, the population of the Earth doubled. It rose from 250 million to probably 500 million. Today, the population of the Earth is rising at such a rate that it will double in half a century. Well, why should overpopulation work to diminish our freedom? Well, in a number of ways. I mean, the, the um, experts in the field, like Harrison Brown, for example, pointed out that in the underdeveloped countries, actually the standard of living is at present falling. The people have less to eat and less goods per capita than they had 50 years ago. And as the position of these countries, the economic position becomes more and more precarious, obviously the central government has to take over more and more responsibility for keeping the ship of state on an even keel. And then, of course, you're likely to get um, social unrest under such conditions with, again, an, in uh, uh, an intervention of the central government. So that I think uh, you, one sees here a pattern which seems to be pushing very strongly towards a totalitarian regime. And unfortunately, as in all these uh, underdeveloped countries, the only highly organized political party is the Communist Party, it, it looks rather as though they will be the heirs to this uh, uh, unfortunate process. Of the we just cover the uh, overpopulation now that he's justified it a bit more? Yes, yes. So his basic argument is, um, well, from an from from a, an evidential perspective of uh, look at all these developing countries which have suffered a, a drop in um, so an increase in population and a drop in uh, in living standards and a, an increase in instability um, and he's proposing that they are linked but I would say that they are not and that they are instead um, driving towards a third factor which is uh, or, well, yeah a third quality which is the colonization versus decolonization uh, question where you have decolonization taking place over this period and then the, the power vacuum creates all sorts of problems uh, in the ensuing sort of neo-colonial conflict between the USSR and the US. And the, the other thing that he uh, he says is that with increasing population, you have uh, increased, increased government to regulate everything, which intuitively kind of makes sense because if you have more people, you have more people interacting with each other. So you need to have a larger body to regulate all of that if you if you if you go for a state um but he said yeah it will lead to to a totalitarian situation and uh i don't want to say he's prophetic about it but it does seem that we we are heading in this direction right now yeah i i think the example that he gives from the developing world is not as good as we now have in the developed world where the issue of overpopulation doesn't arise from this Malthusian concept of there being too many too many people on the planet we now have an issue more in the sense that there's too many people in one area um it's, it's so more that they're it's, standing it's, on each other's toes and it, it, this it's, does lead to you know increased aggravation in the populace in that region it seems yeah it would be a scaling and management problem instead of a resource problem yes exactly so so traditional methusiasm would be um, that that there's not enough food to go around so that or some other resource, not enough electricity, not enough iPhones or something, and that would lead to social unrest. And here you have like, okay, um, we have so many people that we need to add so many rules because so many people are just living so close to each other that this leads to authoritarianism, which then again would lead to other things. So it's only it's only slightly touched on by him, but I think there is kind of something to the idea of um, when you hit a certain point when where the frontiers of a society are no longer sort of available or um, viable anymore. So in the uh, in the US, you would have you would have the case of the, the West being completely you know, overtaken by civilization. And thus, there's nowhere that you can go if you are a you know, sort of more free spirit person who can't get on in society or for, for whatever reason are backed into a backed into a corner. So, you know, mm -hmm. the kind of people who who went West might be some but might be people who um, who couldn't live live on the East Coast because they had such enormous debts or something, or for whatever reason they they couldn't remain there, and so instead, what you have is an underclass of people that is generating, um, that, that is being generated, who have to live within society but outside of it. So you know, physically inside it, but but actually outside of it, um, and that's kind of where you get more of the criminal element coming in. Probably, I, I would suggest as a as a potential. It almost um, almost feel like a separate cast. Yeah, there is a final frontier for those people. <laughs> Which uh, 
Now, now. Well, <laughs> let's continue with the uh, with the interview. <laughs> no, yeah. no, 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 no. I, I just mean that. Uh, yeah, it's something unless you, unless you're referencing uh, Star Trek. That was what I was referencing. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I wasn't saying that there was a solution to the problem. I was saying that there was a final frontier to the problem. Uh, no, I think that there, there is this innate spirit in a certain group of the populace where they they are these kind of um, um, they 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 need pioneer, to go out pioneer. and establish. Yes, yeah. What's the um, there's a specific word that I'm looking for for the kind of ranches that they set up. Um, this is more the free-spirited uh, part of your population that also likes to be entrepreneurial, that, that basically starts new things. Yes, yeah. Yeah. Um, and so in the, uh, in the UK context, we got around that by... So we initially got around that by um, founding colonies. Homesteading, we homesteading is what I'm thinking of. <laughs> sorry. Oh, right, yeah. <laughs> yeah, sorry, carry on. Yeah, so, so in the UK, we expended all of our all of our internal frontiers. Uh, and then we uh, went to the Americas and started using some of, the, some of them. Um, but then and obviously- Thank that, you for that. Yes, and that, that, <laughs> but that eventually became no longer viable. So we had to look elsewhere and eventually you, you get um, you know, cycles of uh, first, first it's South Africa and then it's Australia or the other way around. But you know, these, these places are around the same time. We keep get, stealing our colonies. That's just yeah, what I'm saying. So, yeah. <laughs> so uh, we keep going to different places and, and creating new frontiers essentially where we can uh, you know, offload all of these people who otherwise might be quite damaging to a stable society. But then when you've got nowhere else to put them, what happens to them? They that they they're either going to another civilized society and uh, cause and causing havoc there, or they are staying home and ca causing problems where they are. So what do you do with that problem? I don't think we really know, and that's that that is potentially a Malthusian trap that we haven't yet fallen into, fully, or or, or we are seeing the process of that, but it hasn't fully played out yet. That, that there's no more living space for the people who want to get away from it all. Yeah. Well, it's not even that there's no more living space. It's more that there's no more pioneering space for people to fight against the wilderness to call their own. You know, it's, yeah, it's, some, it's something more than just a place to live. It's a place to conquer. To, yes. Yeah. And I do wonder how much of that is specifically this Anglo. Uh, I think I think, it, think it's everywhere. Uh, maybe, maybe you still have Siberia, but... Uh... At some point, Elon Musk has, has to take us to Mars as the next frontier. <laughs> yeah, we'll have to. Well, I mean, there's there's small definitely small. A, a, an echo of that in all societies. Um, it's just some societies have, uh, to to use a Darwinian term, uh, selected against that for so long that they've you know bred it out of their their uh, their society for the most part. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's probably a combination of that and, you know, just the Anglosphere also had the capability to act on it, <laughs> uh, whereas it, it, certain other um, areas or, or groups potentially would have had that same pioneering spirit if they, you know, it's the old gun germs and steels kind of angle. Uh, uh, well, one of the interesting things that uh, he Huxley brings up is the growth of the bureaucracy and then the the natural growth as as Bishop had uh, mentioned earlier about as population grows bureaucracy necessarily grows with it, but it doesn't appear at least to me that uh, Huxley has a solid uh, understanding or grasp of the scope of op uh, automation and uh, uh, efficiency that can be brought to bear on bureaucrat bureaucratic problems with the advent of computers and the uh, the computer age uh, nowadays the 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 level of awareness and uh, intrusion into everyday uh, life that is taken as a matter of course would probably be uh, uh, an order of magnitude beyond what Huxley would expect uh, to be capable of you know your average ordinary bureaucrat well that blindness to technological innovation is is one of the biggest pitfalls of any kind of Malthusian uh, framework, which he doesn't explicitly fall into um, traditional Malth Malthusian ideas, but he, he does have like a, an altered version of his own, uh, which is kind of blinded to uh, future developments of technology uh, being a solution. Uh, that makes this also really hard to model because those technological developments, they, they don't come in a steady stream. It's all, uh, you, yeah. have, you have a lot of them and then a long time it, it can have a big lull. And uh, well, it's, it's the, 
the incorporation and the assimilation of uh, the the advancement within the rest of society that causes those stretches. Yeah, but it could also be that that right now we need a quite a high level of of uh, GDP and economy and, and manpower to keep this all going. So our our processes have become so complex that at some point, if this if we ever get a, a like like some disaster and reduction in population, that we might not be able to keep this level of technology at this level, and that 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 the uh, the secret of the microprocessor might get lost over time. This is well, certainly that's been that's been seen before, but um, mm -hmm. in, pre in new previous cases, concrete. Well, yeah. Um, I mean, I was thinking specifically of the Bronze Age collapse, where yeah. um, a number of different uh, sort of in interconnected systems sort of um, all, all collapsed at once, and the level of technology dropped. But I would say that um, in that case, I. Suppose I kind of have my own take in a way because a lot of the technologies that end up coming out of that that collapse uh, and are then prevalent afterwards are technologies that already existed at the time of the you know the height of the Bronze Age. It's just they weren't necessarily economical or they weren't really interested in pursuing them to, to, to quite the same degree. So they were capable of making steel, uh, well not steel, but you know iron in the um, in the late Bronze Age or mid mid to late Bronze Age. But it was not something that they were interested in doing particularly, as far as I can tell, anyway. Um, and so, when all of the rest of the structures collapse and all of the uh, all the rest of the society collapses, you suddenly have uh, society advancing along a, a slightly different trajectory to the, the one that they've been on prior. And so, we might see a similar thing where technologies that we have at the moment, which are kind of underdeveloped or underexplored, might become much more prominent going forward because we've chosen to, get, to go in a particular direction, i.e., you know, computing technology, and that becomes no longer viable or no longer interesting for whatever reason, and there and therefore we have to go in that other direction. That also happened during the Industrial Revolution with the steam engine, et cetera, uh, as a consequence uh, of uh, reduction of slavery. Yeah, yeah, similar principle. OK, uh, one, one final point before we carry the video on. At the very beginning, he says that the question po proposed to him is uh, who or what are the enemies? Um, and he says, I don't think there is a who. I think it's more impersonal forces. Um, I don't know how I feel about that. <laughs> I don't know if it is just impersonal forces or if there is a who, um, or whether or not the impersonal forces, if it's more just a case of natural incentives and following incentives. So the who aren't necessarily malicious. They're more just, uh, following their, their incentive chain. Well, this is a very contemporary problem of the, uh, the whole analysis of these kinds of structures is that um, a lot of these things can't happen without without a human will to push them, um, mm -hmm. and the human will tends to follow a certain mold. So, is it that the system is creating or yeah creating success for a certain type of person that that, that can therefore fit into the mold and and gain success, and therefore you get a, a selecting a selected sample, or is it that uh, a certain type of person is is pushing things in a certain direction because because that is the way that they are and they are in that position to do that or something. I think it's both. Some people push in some direction and there are some niches in which some people push and are successful, but there are also a lot of people who push in a direction and nothing happens. It's a bit of a survivor bias you might get from uh, if you only look at the successful people. Yeah, I would mm -hmm. tend to agree, I think. Mm -hmm. And there's also initial self-selection of the group that is feeding the survivors. Yeah. 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 So they can self, they, they can sort of self-select their uh, successes and such. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's carry it on. They will step into the power, position of power. Well, then, ironically enough, the, one of the greatest forces against communism in the world, the Catholic Church, according to your thesis, would seem to be pushing us directly into the hands of the communists because they are against birth control. Well, I think this strange paradox probably is true. There is a... Uh, it's a, an extraordinary situation, actually. I mean, it, one has to look at it, of course, from a biological point of view. The whole essence of, uh, of biological life on Earth is a question of balance. And what we have done is to practice death control in a most uh, intensive manner without uh, balancing this with uh, the birth control at the other end. Consequently, the uh, birth rates remain as high as they were and death rates have fallen substantially. <clears throat> All right, then, so much for the time being, anyway, for overpopulation. Another force, 
that is diminishing our freedoms. Well, another force which I think is very strongly operative in this country is the force of what may be called over-organization. Uh, as technology becomes more and more complicated, it becomes necessary to have more and more elaborate organizations, more hierarchical organizations. And incidentally, the advance of uh, technology has been accompanied by an advance in the science of organization. It's now possible to make organizations on a larger scale than was ever possible before. And so that you have more and more people living their lives out as subordinates in these hierarchical systems controlled by bureaucracies, either the bureaucracies of big business or the bureaucracies of big government. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, the device this is, uh, that you're talking about, are there? This is something we really, really see nowadays, that we have these, these big organizations and they are really controlling a lot of things top down. We even see it in big tech and we see that, that information technology is used by the government a lot in order to basically proceduralize most things in your life. And so you have this, this one bureaucrat who comes along uh, wearing his clipboard and his lanyard. And he <laughs> basically basically has this, this one statement like, OK, um, yeah, this has to happen. And there's no way you can reason with him because it's just part of a bigger process. Um, yeah, I particularly like the fact that he he addresses both sides he says you know this is this is over organization that's occurring both on, on a state's level and and a big business level and it kind of goes back to the previous chat that we had about uh geoeconomics where there are incentives there are incentives for both sides to get to a stage where they basically warp into into one entity um and and even if they don't explicitly become one entity um, if they are acting in such similar ways, um, they are the same in all but name. Well, it's if, just, if, they're, if they're communicating at top level and synchronized that way and they have a top-down structure, then they will behave in the same way. Yes. So, yeah. So then, right. and, yeah. And when you have a certain class of people, uh, you know, the, the kind of uh, bureaucratic elite or you know, um, what's the Burnham phrasing for it? It's the uh, like, managerial uh, elite. Managerial elite. Um, when this crust of people is always coming from the same area and coming from the same background, that it doesn't matter if they are explicitly communicating at the top levels. Um, they are already at a predisposition to follow the same direction. They, they need well, to that, goes, that goes back to the self-selection and the survivor bias. Mm -hmm. You know, because they the any organization uh, elevates those who support the organization as a primary goal. So mm -hmm. you know, uh, the the traditionalists or the the, the 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 classicalists of the organization are the ones that rise to prominence in it because they uh, the the organization rewards them. So as a consequence of that, you're going to see organizations that exist solely to support said organization uh, and yeah. the stagnation of thereof. No, and so I would say that insofar as the organization is is carrying out these actions, such as you know raising certain people, though that, that is only taking place within the context of uh, the minds of people who are minds or wills of people who are already embedded into the into the system. And so they might have their own separate uh, biases one way or another. The organization itself doesn't really have the capacity to and tends not to have, have explicit um, methods of, of promoting people through um, any kind of um, objective metric, if that was even something that it would be capable of doing itself without the input of managers and such. Hmm. Well, if, if you think about how did how we got into this situation, it's it's also you have to take into account that the in amount of information you need to exchange in order to get an organization running in some kind of way or even to get two big organizations to coordinate with each other the most efficient way is to have a a, a top level communication and then just send that information down through the organization it's the same way that um, basically during the cold war the soviet union and the us coordinated with each other the the, the people living in both those countries didn't talk to each other but the leaders did talk to each other and, and that way both those countries showed the same behavior towards each other which kind of assured that nothing would happen luckily although that itself was a a, a learned behavior 
It, it didn't, uh, it, it, it didn't it, start it, out that way. No, no, it was not designed by that, but it, it is the most efficient way of doing stuff in order to assure that you have two big entities coordinating with each other. Because if all those those low level people have to talk to each other, then then you have to exchange so much information that you have to need to do so much synchronization between people that it, this probably will never happen. If he would... he kind of covers that at the very end when the interviewer proposes the question of decentralization versus centralization. Yeah, um, which so we can kind of go into that in a bit more detail uh, later on. <clears throat> so one thing that he doesn't talk about, but I think is is a relevant part of this whole. Um, organization question and uh, probably something that comes out to, well, to me of, of um, reading Brave New World was the idea of creating sort of um, uh, s bottlenecks, I guess, in society or, or like uh, organizational bot bottlenecks, which mean that um, you can create, uh, so despite the fact that you might have a lot of players, um, if they've all got to move through a, uh, a central node, then that, that creates an, an enormous amount of um, power in that one particular spot to either you know, direct things in one direction or another, or simply just you know, give a yay or nay on on certain things that may, might be happening. So you see that with um, with places like uh, Twitter, obviously at the moment, uh, or Facebook, that are able to regulate the the ways in which people are able to communicate with one another because it's become that you know single or you know one of only like three major nodes of communication between large numbers of people. And thus, mm -hmm. you can you can skew things very easily in one direction or another, and exert a huge amount of power um, by operating in what is ostensibly a uh, ostensibly a competitive marketplace. But in actual fact, you know, at, at some point along the along the chain, you have a lot of centralization taking place. Therefore, it's a the entire thing essentially becomes centralized. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a good uh, descriptor. Is you can have you know thousands of lines le leading into this same node, but if that node is corrupted, um, it doesn't matter how it, it doesn't matter the opinions of those lines leading into that node. Um, <laughs> the the, the node out. will crush. <laughs> yeah. yeah, all leading out. Yeah. Um, right. Uh, anything else to, to cover, or should we carry on? I'm good to carry on. Let's go ahead. Specific devices or. Uh... Uh, methods of communication which diminish our freedoms in addition to overpopulation and overorganization? Well, there are certainly devices which can be used in this way. I mean, let us uh, take uh, after all, a piece of very recent and very painful history is the uh, propaganda used by Hitler, which was incredibly effective. I mean, that, what were Hitler's methods? Hitler used terror on the one kind, brute force on the one hand, but he also used a very efficient uh, form of, uh, of propaganda, which uh, uh, he was using every modern device at that time. He didn't have TV, but he had the, the radio, which he used to the fullest extent, and was able to uh, impose his will on an immense mass of people. I mean, the Germans were a highly educated people. Well, we're aware of all this, but how do you equate Hitler's use of propaganda with the way that propaganda, if you will, is used, let us say, here in the United States. Are you suggesting that uh, there no, is a parallel? Needless to say, it's not being used in this way now. But uh, uh, the point is, it seems to me, that there are, are methods at present available, methods superior in some respects to, to Hitler's method, which could be used in a bad situation. I mean, I, what I feel very strongly is that we mustn't be caught by surprise by our own advancing technology. This has happened again and again in history. With technology has advanced, and this changes social conditions. And suddenly, people have found themselves in a situation which they didn't foresee and doing all sorts of things they didn't really want to do. Well, now, what do you mean? Do you mean that we... Imagine my shock. Imagine my shock that, that, that this happens, that we have a new technology like the printing press or the or the, the, the movie projectors, or the radio, or the television, and that this, this technology causes social unrest. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's something that I don't disagree with, but it's, it's only ever really visible through hindsight. They're saying, well, we're misusing this technology. I mean, oh, yeah, it, it, when it's, it's first introduced, you don't really know what is misuse and what's, what's not. Uh, 
Well, I, I remember well, when Twitter, Twitter was introduced and I thought, what would I use it for? So I never signed up, but apparently other people got addicted. And you don't notice how other people are using it until it has such a knock-on effect that at one point it decides uh, a lot of things in your life. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the interesting things about uh, Huxley's position on this is his awareness of the advances of technology and bureaucratic uh, uh, matters in, you know, uh, surveillance matters in uh, propaganda matters, information matters, etc. Yet he doesn't allow for similar advancement in manufacturing or construction or agriculture or any of the things that uh, would be what is on what the uh, the Malthusian problem is predicated you know the, the 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 narrowness of his vision and the the constraints with which he's approaching the problem um, as technology is a panacea for for certain elements but not for the entirety of the the, the problems is really interesting to note I, th I think his point is more that that at uh, it, it might at least during this interview, it's, it's not uh, classical Malthusianism that it comes to resources, but it does, seems more that there's a limit to the amount we can effectively communicate to each other. My cynical mind is saying that it might be that a man like Huxley knows how to utilize the tools of, of communication and propaganda and doesn't know how to utilize the more manufacturing tools. And so that's why his his focus would be on that. Um, he sees them as more as having more utility, and and the and any kind of technological development outside of that as um, being kind of beyond his his scope um, because he, he he can't properly utilize them. To me, it's a it's a matter of what he chose to specialize in and what he what he's put most of his focus on because. Um, you see this in the uh, in the way that Orwell comes across as well when he's talking about uh, primarily sort of structures of governmental control and uh, you know gov uh, and focuses very much on the governmental level, whereas Huxley's looking much more at the persuasion level, and he um, widens that scope a little bit to look at all forms of persuasion um, and sees that one of the places where where it's being pioneered is in the public sector. So he he sees the public sector as playing a predominant role in his uh, in his dystopia. You also and, have to. And this is. I was just going to say this echoes the self-selection and survivor bias points that were made earlier. Uh, yeah. Another thing you probably have to take into account is that uh, this interview is in the fifties, where it, it seemed that uh, nuclear power would provide limitless em energy. So back then they were talking about uh, nuclear trains and nuclear planes and nuclear ro rockets. Well, that didn't pan out like that exactly. Uh, yeah, I think he even mentions that in, in, in a little bit. So, yeah. so it, it seemed that that resource-wise, uh, there was a, a was a big bake, a breakthrough by harnessing the atom, and that would mean that that we would head to a a uh, society of plenty where we would have no scarcity anymore. But that implies that uh, Malthusianism would be, you know, practically overnight eradicated as a concern if you've got access to near infinite energy or functionally infinite energy. Yeah. So, those two things don't necessarily go together. Well, that's probably that could be a reason why they're not talking about uh, about resources at this moment. Hmm. There's also, I mean, this is a little bit off of what the discussion is, but when it comes to them thinking they found a near infinite energy supply, the Malthusian. Th this is where the Malthusian lens <clears throat> started to to change as they looked at it as a as a more eugenicist um issue than than just a sheer resource issue it became we must have population control um to manage who is in the populace and who is on top of the <laughs> the populace as opposed to just uh, because there's not enough resources to go around so one of the thing that did jump out at me um is the naivety i suppose um or perhaps just perhaps it's just sort of anchoring bias in that um he doesn't perceive the the, uh, the phenomena at work in terms of like propaganda and persuasion and such applying to uh, his own sphere or, or you know what he's been brought up in. I thought that was that was very interesting. I I was I was saying this earlier. I think he does know. I just think he's toning down his 
his self-awareness of the US for c- considering he's on TV in the US. <laughs> might be, uh, McCarthy is watching and Nixon. Yeah, I, I feel like he he cannot not be aware of it. You know, he's he's a he's very knowledgeable on the subject, and I I, I just refuse to accept that he 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 can't perceive his own lens. Uh, he can't perceive his own um, camp as, as as having the same issues. I thought I thought it was quite a, an interesting uh, contrast against um, the the very entry of the. Uh, or the the intro rather to the to the whole interview when uh, they were talking about discussing issues of or, or was it threats to security and freedom? Mm-hmm. I thought that was quite curious. Yeah, the frame games are already at play. Yeah. Right. Let's carry it on. But we don't know how to use it correctly. Is that the point that you're making? Well, at present, the television I think is being used uh, quite harmlessly. It's being used, I think. Uh, I would feel it's being used too much to distract everybody all the time. But I mean, imagine, which must be the situation in all communist countries where the television, where it exists, is always saying the same thing the whole time. It's always driving along. It's not creating a wide front of distraction. It's creating a one-pointed drumming in of a single idea all the time. It's obviously an immensely powerful instrument. Can I can I insert the uh, this is a danger to a democracy meme here? <laughs> I was just going to say, can, can you imagine that? I, yeah, I, mean, no. I, I couldn't possibly imagine such a world in which no, uh, yeah. uh, narratives were completely aimed in one direction. But you know, maybe we'll, like, one, yeah. maybe one day, maybe one day, yeah. <laughs> so you're talking about the potential misuse of the instrument? Uh, exactly. We have a thought. Uh, all technology is in itself morally neutral. These are just powers which can either be used well or ill. It's the same thing with atomic energy. We can either use it to blow ourselves up or we can use it as a substitute for the coal and the oil which are running out. You've even written about the use of drugs in this light. Well, now, this is a very interesting uh, subject. I mean, in this book that you mentioned, this book of mine, Brave New World, uh, I postulated a substance called Soma, which was a very versatile drug. It would... uh, make people feel happy in small doses. It would uh, make them see visions in medium doses, and it would send them to sleep in large doses. Well, I don't think uh, such a drug exists now, nor do I think it will ever exist. But we do have drugs which will do some of these things. And I think it's quite on the cards that we may have drugs which will profoundly change uh, our mental states without doing us any harm. I mean, this is the the pharmacological revolution which is uh, that's just it's not, not possible, possible. <laughs> I, uh, th- there's just no physical possible way for uh, a drug as he's describing to change the fundamental awareness of a fundamental biochemistry of the brain without causing long-term effects it's i think he's basically uh, describing antidepressants but you're right about the long-term effects these uh He's basically, I think, talking about drugs that that will make you happier without the really negative uh, properties of of things like cocaine or uh, other hard drugs. Yeah, well, depends, I think he's... depends whether both <clears throat> sides of the equation are considered um, uh, desirable, I suppose. So you might look at something like the um, the contraceptive pill, um, because obviously that has uh, that has chemical side effects and um, you know personality side effects, um, but. That is, I mean, I, I guess looked at another way. You might you might look at that as uh, as the same kind of phenomenon, but the the other effect is what people are actually looking for, and then uh, the the sort of you know mental effects are not something that people really paid attention to until uh, much after it had already become very mainstreamed. Yeah, yeah. That's I, what think, well, I, mean, it, for me. I don't think he's describing anything that is free of any side effects, but that they're negligible enough to not cause the issues uh, as as found with you know cocaine as he uh, uses as an example i just uh, i've never seen a a anything based upon human psychology or biochemistry that did not have uh subsequent addictive effects uh you know for uh, at least a certain segment of the population i mean even just physical activities 
you know, people get addicted to, and then they require more and more and more to get their fix, you know, adrenaline junkies, et cetera. Mm. Yeah, I think this was also around the same time. I'm I'm not an expert in this field, but I think uh, ecstasy was also in development around this kind of time. And obviously, with Huxley was a big proponent of of LSD as well, um, which is funny because yeah, you know that definitely does have some side effects. Uh, it's not exactly a risk free drug. Well, that's so. that that was a uh, a crutch uh adopted by much of the intelligentsia of the time mm -hmm. uh it, it goes all the way into carl sagan and you know elon musk and some of the other people you know in current day mm -hmm. the joe rogans of the world uh, yes <laughs> right powerful mind-changing drugs which physiologically speaking are almost costless i mean they are not like opium or like coca uh, cocaine, which uh, do change the state of mind, but uh, leave terrible results physiologically and morally. Mr. Huxley, in your new essay, you state that these various enemies of freedom are pushing us toward a real-life brave new world, and you say that it's awaiting us just around the corner. First of all, can you detail for us what life in this brave new world which you fear so much, or what life might be like, well, to start with, I think this kind of the dictatorship of the future, I think will be very unlike uh, the dictatorships which we've been familiar with in the immediate past. I mean, take another book prophesying the future, uh, which was a very remarkable book, uh, George Orwell's 1984. Mm -hmm. Well, this book was written at the height of the Stalinist regime and just after the Hitler regime. And he, there he foresaw a dictatorship using entirely the methods of terror, the methods of physical violence. Now, I, I think what, what is going to happen in the future is the dictators will find, as the old saying goes, that you can do everything with bayonets except sit on them. That if you want to preserve your power indefinitely, you have to get the consent of the ruled. And this they will do, partly by drugs, as I foresaw in... Uh, uh, in Brave New World, partly by these uh, new techniques of, uh, uh, of propaganda. They will do it by bypassing the sort of rational side of man and appealing to his uh, subconscious and his uh, deeper emotions and uh, his physiology even. And so making him actually love his slavery. I mean, I think this is the danger, that actually people may be in some ways happy under the new... A regime, but they will be happy in situation where they oughtn't to be happy. Can I uh, ask uh, anybody in the panel if they're ready to throw away their mobile phone? I, I, I've as, already stopped carrying it, it around with me. As, as, in, as, as, as in, in return, return for what? No, as, as a dopamine machine. So she's talking about that the the the, uh, the regime of the future will use uh, happiness. So that's basically giving you dopamine hits. Uh, you, you will own nothing and you'll be happy. Uh, yeah. and, and what I'm seeing is, and that, that since we have a mobile phone, people are using it to get a quick, quick dopamine fix. You look at Facebook, you look at your Twitter posts, you feel happy. It's a, a very, very short reward cycle and you're not, not doing anything long term anymore. Uh, well, I mean, governments have been doing that to their populace since, you know, the beginning of time. They've been the, bribing the, the people to keep them in power. That, well, this is, this is the issue that uh, I find with his analysis, um, is that he describes it as being a new concept that they will uh, bypass the rational mind and go straight for the emotions. You know, the old uh, feelings don't care about your facts route to get a vote. I, he, the way he describes it is, is that it's this this new phenomena, but I mean, isn't, isn't that what's been happening since, <laughs> since day dot? It's, it's, well, I, I would refute the, refute the, um, the point that he made that you have to uh, obtain the consent of the governed to be, uh, to be able to run a stable government. That, I mean, that the, the history, <laughs> the history of, uh, of the French transition from, uh, monarchy to Repo republicanism is, uh, is, is clear evidence of that. If you don't like the result, you can just ignore it and carry on as though it, as though it never happened. So the rebuttal to that is that by not revolting 
uh, the governed are giving their uh, tacit implicit consent. consent. Yeah, they're, yeah, they're, they're, they're tacit consent to being governed. Um, which I don't know. It's I can look at it from either side because, especially now, I suppose the 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 modern the reason that it's different now is as he describes it as a a, a populace is being fed. The, this uh, dopamine hits from technology. Um, if they are happy in their slavery, then they have no reason to revolt. And so, are they even giving consent if uh, I, he's, he's just talking up about to dopamine machines? He's just talking in a Machiavellian way about the most stable way to uh, to build something. So, if you, if you look at Machiavelli and he's in the Prince, he's talking about yeah, the best way is to have the the consent of the people because then you don't need to hire anybody to uh, to to help you and 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 he's talking a bit about the same thing so if your government does something mm -hmm. which pleases you yeah then you say well it, it benefits me even if in the long term it it, it, it hurts you so uh, and that's 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 the thing that he's talking per, perhaps talking about feelings versus uh, rationality because rationality wise you would say well this is not a good way to live and I have to plan ahead but if I'm just happy tonight and I have my pizza and I have my uh, my bottle of Coke light. And the game well, that goes back to the, the perspective of perverse incentives in that, you know, the good governments as a general rule are incentivized to keep the populace happy, but they're not incentivized to do anything, you know, that actually improves the, the, the lives of the people. Was it bread and games in the, in the bread Roman and circuses? Time? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah bread yeah. and circuses. Yeah. That's, that's the, 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 uh, bribes to which I was referring earlier. Yeah, and uh, so, but but what happens, and what you also saw last year was that a lot of those incentives, uh, this, those gifts from the government, fall away. Like here in the Netherlands, we have uh, like soccer is sponsored by the government to some degree. Like they get cheap leases on the on the land where the stadium is standing on, and things like that, in order to to have that these these teams can have their competition and then on Sunday people have something to watch but that all fall, fell away and then you, people get quite unruly because they're uh, the, the thing the government provides falls away and then you get civil unrest so it is it, is, it, it might be stable but as long as you can can provide for that stuff uh, which makes them happy well I mean the other side of the equation though is that uh, if you if you have a line of a line of men pointing rifles at uh, at a crowd and the crowd doesn't have any any particular leaders because you've already got rid of the leaders um how many people with you know families and uh, and some stake in the stake stake in the continued survival of of the uh, the country or the nation in in any particular form uh, how many how many of them are going to charge the charge the guns how many bullets do you need and the answer might be none right right so yeah so in that in that case if you just need to you just need to set the uh, the cost benefit analysis to be so high that the you know the cut the costs are well, the costs are much higher than the than the potential benefits and so you you can just sit on a bayonet if you're if you're talking about it in terms of requiring consent only requiring that you get people to settle down and not and not rise against you yeah but force some... perceived as force achieved yeah but at, yeah, at, yeah. At, at some point they will find a way to screw you over well i mean well, i mean you, you get to the you get rid of all the uh, elites basically yeah, you get to the point where instead of people saying, I, I can't do this because of my children, I have to do this for my children. That's when things start to, to, to change. That's when the mob doesn't need leaders. And another narrative is if you screwed over somebody's father, that will also uh, do it. That's well, what they, always, they, they always need leaders because, uh, because in order to implant that idea into somebody's head, you need to have done that from a centralized source already. You have to have a grand unifying idea to, to make people think that the future is going to be terrible if they don't rise I, up. You, that's a, you that's you like a central node you've created. You need a communication channel. And traditionally, that would be through an organization which has a leader. But if you have something like a Reddit forum that might also organize people in some way without having any clear leaders in it. Well, you might not have any. Yeah. You might not have any uh, any distinguishing ranks, but if one Is person right? <laughs> puts forward an idea that everyone's going to get behind, then you've got a de facto leader. Were you hinting yeah. at any recent event at, at that uh, use of Reddit? No. <laughs> I <laughs> no, like just, just an example. Could could be anything. Could be four ten. <laughs> could be uh, yes. But but anywhere where people just get together and exchange ideas might form that people just automatically organize and from that moment on then you might need more bullets than there are actual people 
Well, totally. I mean, Sparta Sparta had a very good uh, method of dealing with this, where they took all the people who would potentially be those thought leaders and removed them out of the hell population. Didn't Sparta collapse at one point due to stagnation, if I remember correctly? Uh, kind they had of. a good run, though. Yeah, so, sort of, yeah. But they, they were never brought down by a peasant uprising. No. Or a slave uprising. That Just never happened. An outside force. Yeah, it was... <laughs> well, outside force combined with uh, internal stagnation. But that was among the... Uh, among the among the Spartan population themselves, not a not a factor of anything that the Helots did. All right. Anyway, before we start uh, rambling about the Romans for three quarters, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's let's continue this. Let me ask you this: You're talking about a world that could take place within the confines of a totalitarian state. Let's become more immediate, more urgent about it. We believe, anyway, that we live in democracy here in the United States. Do you believe that this brave new world that you talk about uh, could, let's say, in the next quarter century, the next century, could come here to our shore? I think it could. I mean, I, I, that's why I feel it's so extremely important here and now to start thinking about these problems, not to let ourselves be taken by surprise by the and new advances in technology. I mean, the, for example, in, in regard to the use of the, of the drugs, we know there's enough evidence now for us to be able, on the basis of this evidence, and using a certain amount of creative imagination, to foresee the kind of uses which could be made in a, uh, by people of bad will with these things, and to attempt to, to forestall this. And in the same way, I think, with these other methods of uh, propaganda, we can foresee and we can do a good deal to forestall. I mean, after all, the um, price of freedom is eternal vigilance. You write in Enemies of Freedom, you write specifically about the United States. You say this, writing about American political campaigns. You say all that is needed is money and a candidate who can be coached to look sincere. Political principles and plans for specific action have come to lose most of their importance. The personality of the candidate, the way he is projected by the advertising experts, are the things that really matter. Well, this is, uh, uh, during the last campaign, there was a great deal of uh, this kind of uh, statement by the advertising managers of the campaign parties, this idea that the, uh, the candidates had to be merchandised as though they were soap or toothpaste and that you had to depend entirely on the personality. I'm, I mean, the personality is important, but there are certainly people with an extremely amiable personality, particularly on TV, who might not necessarily be very good uh, uh, in poli poli uh, positions of political trust. Well, do you feel that men like Eisenhower, Stevenson, Nixon, with knowledge of forethought, were trying to pull the wool over the eyes of the American public? Uh, no. Do we? Do we? Yes, yes, of course. <laughs> uh, what do you mean I trying? <laughs> yeah, I also wouldn't say though that it's a it's a new phenomenon either. It's it's kind of endemic to um, human relations. I uh, would probably go as far as to say. Um, mm -hmm. I you think it's among, amongst um, exacerbated when you're in a democracy. I think it's, it's exacerbated uh, when you're in a democracy. But but when you look at um, you know CEOs and such people who who end up rising high into in any um, any organization, then you tend to find that they have have certain characteristics that we would, you know, typically associate with people who who we just instinctively associate with leaders, I suppose, in that you know they're tall and uh, they have they have a certain disposition about them, um, and so we look for those kinds of traits, regardless of whether or not they're they're accompanied by any traits of competence in any other regard. It reminds me of uh, Lord of the Flies, where they select uh, the leader basically not because he's the most competent, but he looks most like the leader. Yeah. Isn't that the old thing about uh, Warren G. Harding? That he was just the most unremarkable person, but uh, he just looked presidential. Well, it's it's people are looking something f of like uh, which is familiar, and uh, if you, if you read uh, what's the name, uh, Thinking Fast and Slow, the the author remarks that if you have a square jaw and a uh, and a good smile, then then you have a higher chance to be elected, even if your policies are exactly the same, because people will just vote for that kind of person. Mm -hmm. Yep. Well, I mean, these are just basic sociological constants, you know. 
Yeah. It's phrenology, Human, isn't it? Uh, it's always been around. <laughs> yeah. Humans have always respond to, you know, the uh, the genetically ben you know, uh, those who are genetically gifted with, you know, fine features, strong bodies, etc. And when you couple that with, you know, uh, sociological uh, personality that has been built through positive socio social feedback throughout their developing years, you get leaders. Mm -hmm. Well, this is the problem because it's not meritocratic. It's automatically assumed to be you know, just this bias that has no no reason, and it's just a, something that we must crush. But I mean, it it has a it has a basis in reality that uh, you want healthy stock to be leading you. Basically, you don't want these uh, you know spiteful mutants <laughs> to be at the head of the uh, the head of the society. So that's why you're looking for the tool. Uh, strong jawed gentleman to be. Uh, let, let's, assume, let's assume that the correlation exists. It, it, it is easier for most people to assume that this correlation is, is true because they don't have to spend think, thinking about it or, or listening mm -hmm. to uh, all, these, uh, all these points and evaluating it and just go like their gut feeling will say, oh, square jawed, broad smile, good leader. That, that, because that's the least amount of mental effort. Yeah, and I'm not saying it's going to always find you the best leader, but it has a basis in re it has a reason, and the reason is genetically sound, if not uh, politically. Well, this would only well, it's also this would only be appropriate if we were electing kings as well, which we're not. So it means that you can take a person like that to be the face of your of your actual governing apparatus, and then mm -hmm. the rest of it can be whatever you like. Yeah, and that's what well, he's saying. Also... <clears throat> Sorry, Carol. I was just going to say that it's it's also um, a, a physical manifestation of social acceptance. You know, society manifests um, a sociological pressure for leaders that match a sociological ideal. So, as you know, the quote unquote uh, pre leader grows up in society, society exalts that individual and, and essentially grooms them for leadership by shaping the way society responds to them in such a fashion that they and society form you know a a symbiotic relationship yeah well i mean again this is kind of assuming that what you're electing is the actual leader and that the the version of the person that you're being presented is the version that the person is the version of the person that actually exists Whereas, well, that's, you know, that's you never, about, again. You could talk about Bill Clinton being being a, you know, that that kind of person. But was he was he actually like was the the face that he was projecting to the public the same face that he was actually you know living or actually had? I would say probably not. Yeah, but and I think that's the argument too, that uh, Huxley's making is that it's more of an advertising exercise than anything else. It's yeah. get a pretty face and. We'll brand the Democratic Party with it, but um, behind the scenes, you've got two hundred other people actually working out the, <laughs> what we're going to be doing. Yeah. Isn't that how, uh, online, how online influencers work nowadays? You have pretty people just showing off stuff, and then they get yeah. money for that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, my, my contention though would be that this isn't a new new phenomenon. Uh, no, 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 at all. Not at all. And that's what I'm talking about when I when I say how society grooms them for leadership, because as as people like that grow up, if they continually rely on their own judgment and make stupid and stupid and stupid decisions, then the society will reject them. So they're they're teaching those people to use the decisions of others who are more intelligent to them and then rebrand those decisions as their decisions, which is, you know, the essence of politics. And the people that they're using the decisions of also are being uh, taught to basically up it, uh, provide their ideas to the to the pretty face, um, mm -hmm. uh, and, and when it the, works well, the ladder. It's a, it's a symbiotic way. relationship. Yeah. When it works poorly, it's a an exploitative relationship, and society doesn't like that. Yes. Yeah, the way that you described it made it sound much more uh, parasitic. Yeah, well, <laughs> is it inaccurate? <laughs> well, I don't know. Anyway, should we carry on? Let's have a look. <laughs>
Oh, but they were, they were being advised by powerful um, advertising agencies who were making campaigns of a quite different kind from what had been made before. And I think we shall see probably uh, all kinds of uh, new devices uh, coming into the picture. I mean, the, for example, this thing which got a good deal of publicity last autumn, a subliminal projection. I mean, as it stands, this thing, I think, is of uh, no menace to us at the moment. But I was talking the other day to one of the people who has done most experimental work in the in psychological laboratory with this, who was saying precisely this, that it is not at the moment a danger, but once you've established a principle uh, that something works, you can be absolutely sure that the technology of it is going to improve steadily. And I mean, his view of the subject was that, uh, well, maybe they will use it to some extent in the 1960 campaign, but they will probably use it a good deal and much more effectively in the 1964 campaign, because this is the kind of rate at which technology advances. And we'll be persuaded to vote for a candidate that we do not know that we are being persuaded to vote exactly. for. Exactly. I mean, this is the rather alarming feature, mm. that you're being persuaded below the level of choice and reason. In no. Uh, and of course, they figured out that they don't need to use subliminal messaging when they can just uh, <laughs> rig the votes. <laughs> 64, not well, right. You may talk about 60. Yeah, 60. Yeah, this he uh, he spoke about the 50, uh, the 60. Uh, obviously, 64. 64 was uh, probably was just as dodgy. That was uh, Johnson, wasn't it? Yes. LBJ. Yes. Well, I mean, going back to his point about you know people making emotional decisions, that they, they've they very rarely throughout history made rational decisions. It's the, the leadership that, that recognizes uh, the, the, the forecoming problems and they decide to act rationally rather than the people and they just convince the people that that's what they wanted, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, even even well, rational decisions that can be based on, um, on inappropriate or, or incorrect or, um, you know, perhaps selected sets of uh, information or or perceptions, so. Or invalid value hierarchies. Yeah, there you go, stuff like that. So it's, yeah, it's not just a case of one good, one bad. Which you mentioned just a little ago. In your writing, particularly in Enemies of Freedom, you attack Madison Avenue, which controls most of our television and radio, advertising, newspaper advertising, and so forth. Why do you consistently attack the advertising uh, agency? Well, no, I, I, I think that uh, advertisement plays a very necessary role, but the danger, it seems to me, in a democracy is this. I mean, what does a democracy depend on? A democracy depends on the individual voter making an intelligent and rational choice for what he regards as his enlightened self-interest in any given circumstance. But what these people are doing, I mean, what both, for their particular purposes for selling goods and the dictatorial um, propagandists are doing is to try to bypass the rational side of man and to appeal directly to these unconscious forces below the surface so that you are in a way making nonsense of the whole democratic procedure which is based on conscious choice of on rational ground if only yeah we've we've covered this quite a lot already but i just think that whole segment is i've got a lot of respect for this man but it's just a lot of nonsense <laughs> this this uh, enlightened rationalist uh pure I, I, view of I, democracy I, just, idyllic view of democracy that everybody is making a rational choice when they uh, they're electing somebody yeah yeah, yeah. it does Has never been seen yeah, it does make me wonder at the um, the fascination of of propaganda from the democratic perspective, looking at the at the more totalitarian perspective, I suppose. Because if anything, the impetus for propaganda is is more severe in the democratic system, because there's actually a lot more value in uh, manipulating public perceptions. Well, isn't the public perception of democracy itself subject to propaganda? I mean, this is clearly yep. a, a propagandized vision of what democracy actually is yes yeah i, I would agree 100 percent. but they um so so that's that's kind of what i'm i'm saying is that the the lack of self-reflection in that regard is uh curious troubling is what i'd say yeah yeah <laughs> propaganda is yeah. only important when the people's opinion matters 
Right, right. That's what I'm. Yeah, that's what I mean. Well, that's not. Sh- you can specifically you could specifically target it to the f- few that were head of state if if you were in a more oligarchical system, I suppose. Yeah. But but so you're still going to f- always be subject to the the veto of the masses. Hmm. In what regard? In in the physical regard of revolution. Well, I would. Go on. I would say that the propaganda is going to have a use, whatever system that you have. Um, it's just that democracy it has it has the most impact because the more people you can persuade via uh, propaganda, the, the the more votes you can accrue. But it, I don't think that um, that being in a more being in any kind of different structure is, is going to to change the effectiveness of propaganda. And in fact, you might be able to make it more targeted to those who do hold the cards. Mm -hmm. When you vote, my friend, you are exercising force, and force is violence. The supreme authority from which all other authority is derived. Where is that from? (laughs) Starship Troopers. I thought, yeah, Yeah. I was was like, I was detecting hints of Heinlein. Right. Let's carry on. Of course, well, maybe maybe I, you have just answered this, this next question, because in your essay, you write about television commercials, not just political commercials, but television commercials as such. And how, as you put it, today's children walk around singing beer commercials and toothpaste commercials. And then you link this phenomenon in some way with the dangers of a dictatorship. Now, could you spell out the connection, or how do you feel that you have done so sufficiently? Well, I mean, here, okay, this whole question of children, I think, is a terribly important one, because the children are quite clearly much more suggestible than the average grown-up. And uh, again, I suppose that, uh, that for one reason or another, all the propaganda was in the hands of one or very few agencies. You would uh, have an extraordinarily powerful force playing on these children, who are all going to grow up and be adults quite soon. Uh, I do think that uh, this is not an immediate threat, but it, it remains a possible threat. And you said something to the effect in your essay that the children of Europe used to be called cannon fodder, and here in the United States they are television and radio fodder. Well, uh, after all, they, you can read in the uh, in the trade journals the most lyrical accounts of how necessary it is to get hold of the children, because then they will be loyal brand buyers later on. So. I, I mean, again, the, you just translate this into political terms. The dictator says they will be loyal ideology buyers when they're grown up. We hear so much about brainwashing as used by the communists. Do you see any brainwashing other than that, which we've been just been talking about, that is used here in the United States? Other forms of brainwashing? Yes. Yes. <laughs> and <then> again, <laughs> after that comment of him talking about the children, this is why I think that even though he doesn't fully admit it on this interview, I he, I, I can't picture him not being aware of, of the same conditions existing in the US. But maybe maybe uh, given his vehement defense of, of democracy, maybe I'm giving him too much credit. Maybe he isn't as self-aware as uh, I might like to attribute to him. Not in the form uh, that uh, has been used in, in China and in Russia, because uh, this is uh, essentially the application of propaganda methods, the most violent kind, to individuals. It's not a shotgun method like mm-hmm. the, uh, the advertising method. It's a way of getting hold of the person and playing both on his physiology and his psychology till he really breaks down, and then you can implant a new idea in his head. I mean, the descriptions of the methods are really blood-curdling when you you read them. And not only the methods applied to political prisoners, but the methods applied, for example, to the training of the young communist administrators and missionaries. They receive a, an incredibly tough kind of training, which may causes about 25% of them to break down or commit suicide, but produces 75% of completely one-pointed fanatics. The question, of course, that keeps coming... That's called education. If that statistic is true, that that, that 
That would be incredible. One in four of them having a breakdown and killing themselves. Or did he say or? Or, or killing themselves, I think. Right, okay. yeah, okay. So it's probably dramatically lower than that. I, uh, he, I well, a three in four success rate is, is perfectly acceptable for a totalitarian environment. And I'd argue that it's perfectly acceptable in most environments. Yeah, I, th I think you would need a, a lot lower amount of people who are zealots in order to, to keep it stable. Well, I think you'd probably need a lot uh, a lot greater degree of respect for life, I suppose, to, to really consider that alarming. Well, and, yeah. and as we identified at the beginning with the Malthusian uh, perspective, that's that's sadly lacking in, in most individuals of that, that uh, can't. Well, even less in even less so in um, communists. Yes. But I mean, that's that's the 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 foundation for the industrial uh, schooling environment that was implemented across America over the last half century. Yeah. You know, well, the, the three, three and four students surviving. <laughs> no, no, the the uh, um, the attempted. The, the, they've been trying to tailor education uh, to the individual student, such that they uh, they are the ones that are focusing on learning the actual lesson, which is primarily conformity. Uh, so. And and as we we see in you know inner city schools and such, they they are having about a three and four success rate. No, oh, God, if some of them got three and four, they'd be <laughs> they'd be rioting in the streets at how successful this school was. Some of the figures what? that Sol mentions is uh, just astonishing. That like ninety ninety percent failure at math mathematics. That's not the objective. Uh, right. Okay, I'm with you. Yeah. <laughs> The, the objective is so, success rate in uh, their actual aims <laughs> in, in social yeah. cohesion. Okay. Yeah. 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 I'm with you. And support of the existing establishment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, well, in that case, I think three and four might be a very low ball, <laughs> especially for certain communities. Mm -hmm. uh, probably, probably closer to nine and ten. I, I also did notice that that. Uh, regimes like Chinese regime have copied a lot of American advertising tactics. So actually, you could claim that the uh, post Second World War advertising tactics they developed, which which might uh, have followed from propaganda methods uh, developed during the Second World War, yeah. are, are more effective in indoctrinating people and and getting conformity a message uh, than than traditional tactics. Uh, if only it started just by trying to sell more products, but that seemed to be so effective that they also started using it in the political arena. Well, in uh, in World War One, it was quite it was quite severe as well. I mean, that's yeah. um, that's one of the things that makes me think that perhaps uh, Aldous Huxley is um, is is not quite so aware of his own uh, sort of biases because that's that I think that's quite common to the way that the propaganda is viewed from the first half of the twentieth century generally is that. Um, in the British case, that they would just um, shrink away from any idea that uh, that they were being that they were doing the same thing that Germany was doing in World War II, say. But I mean, the perception was from the German perspective that you know the British were were being even more uh, draconian about their about their propaganda. You know, more, well, that's uh, because we're correct. That's <laughs> that, that, that's that's always the, the justification. We, you know, we, we can't be using the same tactic. I, I, we're right. I, I, yeah, I exactly. Think, well, I, think, exactly yeah. I think you're also blind to your own pro propaganda because you already believe it as the truth. So you don't see it as something that's trying to convince yeah. you, just confirming it. So yeah, how can it be bad? Well, the the, the opponents' propaganda. You say, nah, that can't be right. Propagandizing uh, confirmation bias. Well, I mean, just think about you know your core values and and were they. Did you derive? Did you arrive at them through logical, empirical analysis, or were they inculcated within you through propaganda during your developmental years? Well, I mean, how much empirical analysis can you take? Can you take on as as one person uh, if you're if you're cutting out all secondary sources? If you're going only by primary sources, really, how how much can you how much can you get? I think that's kind of the problem. The moment that you outsource that at all. Um, out to you know other organizations or other people who are going to be mediating uh, and, and like giving you that information um, from their perspective, then uh, 
you've already you've already allowed it in to some extent to some extent. Mm -hmm. But it's kind of necessary to just be able to function in the world. <laughs> yeah, you can get very much lost in these kind of uh, nature nurture debates. Um, so I think there's an extent to which they can be quite useless because you just have to tackle <laughs> tackle the issue regardless of the source. It's turtles all the way down. Exactly. Yeah. Um, I, I think we can. I think we can carry on. I just wanted to bring up, uh, although it's something we've already covered, but not quite in the phrasing of it, is just the soft power versus hard power. Um, I think that this really was the period in which the realization that if you make a populace feel like they are opting for what you are giving them, um, you, not a single bullet has to be shot. I I, I would argue that that uh, discovery had already been made in ancient Rome, and and it's it's rediscovered over you know repeatedly yeah. yeah the challenge is as it always has been satisfying the promises that are made you know until and unless one can figure out a way to continually satisfy the promises that are made and the gifts that are to be given from the government this the collapse is always you know uh what is it 72 hours away in major cities mm -hmm. uh, and then that's where the whole modern monetary theory thing uh, seems to have cachet nowadays because it's, it's a theoretical economic model that might provide an opportunity to actually make good on those promises. Yes. Um, but depending on what the promises are, it can be easier to placate people by just giving them more bread and circuses than, than, actually meeting your obligations and we now live in an era where the gibbs are easier than ever it's always a fine line that threshold right so let's carry on obviously politics in themselves are not evil television is not in itself either evil atomic energy is not evil and yet you seem to fear that it will be used in an evil way. Why is it that the right people will not, in your estimation, use them? Why is it that the wrong people will use these various devices and for the wrong motives? Well, I think one of the, uh, of the reasons is that uh, these are all instruments for uh, obtaining power, and obviously the passion for power is one of the most moving passions that exist in man, and is, after all, this is all democracies are based on the proposition that power is very dangerous and that it's uh, extremely important not to let any one man or any one small group have too much power for too long a time after what are the british and american constitutions except devices for limiting power and all these uh, new devices are extremely efficient instruments for the imposition of power by small groups over larger masses well you ask this question yourself in Enemies of Freedom, I'll put, the, I'll put your own question back to you. You ask this. In an age of accelerating overpopulation, of accelerating overorganization, and ever more efficient means of mass communication, how can we preserve the integrity and reassert the value of the human individual? Rupert, what's your answer? <laughs> uh, <laughs> Yeah. So, um, well, I mean, I mean the, the thing that me most immediately struck uh, came to mind was that he's he's almost got it completely the wrong way around with um, with the 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 question of power and limiting power. Because, I mean, to me, democracy is is much more about obfuscating the, the power relationships and allowing more power to be centralized in fewer hands rather than the reverse. Yeah. Because although it claims to do the opposite, it, it allows um, other other interests to be. Um, to be working a bit behind the scenes whilst people are focusing on the wrong on the wrong questions. Yeah, it's like a, it's like a political system that uh, a version of Robert Conquest's third law. Um, that and uh, over time, any any organization will eventually hate hate its uh, original explicit aim, 
Uh, it's like democracy was originally meant to be a check on power, uh, it, if you believe that. Yeah, I don't think narrative. it. I don't think it ever was. But. No, yeah, but that, that was that is often used as uh, as the reasoning for it. But uh, it is now just an obfuscation of of where power lies, and a way of mounting up the power. <laughs> But uh, anyone actually have an answer to the question that, that was proposed about uh, human individuality? Well, they, he said that why don't the good people uh, uh, get power? And then you assume that there are inherently good and inherently bad people. Well, I still think that power corrupts and absolute power absolute, corrupts absolutely. So it's more of a uh, given enough time, anybody will become corrupt if you give them power. I do tend to look at it much more in the much more in the, the frame that uh, that he uses of, of good people and bad people, but um, systematizing it. So so the, the the framing of the question is wrong almost in, in a set, in a sense because it it implies that there's a system that you can create which will lead to good people getting into positions where they ought to be. Whereas I don't think that's that's possible. It's um it's one of those economic laws, I suppose, where I can't remember which one exactly. That um, you know, once you once you use a, a metric as a measure. Then, or a measure as a metric, rather, whichever way around it is, then it ceases to become a good a, a good measurement because, like, once once people figure out how to start gaming the system in order to acquire the power that the uh, that the measurement is supposed to be uh, leading towards, or this, but the the um, that they're supposed to be mer measuring the merit, yeah. Um, you don't get you don't get a good measurement of it anymore. So you, you're not measuring the actual merit anymore. You're measuring the extent to which people can uh, game the system to put themselves in that position, in the same way that what we were talking about earlier with the um the hu different the different heuristics to that uh, that people use to put people into um into positions of power via democratic mandate uh those get manipulated by the interests that want to gain power as some kind of you know corporate entity or some kind of like um power behind the person so you just find somebody to be the face of the whole operation but the but behind the scenes you've got much more much more of a okay, larger operation. <laughs> yeah, yeah. A so example, um, example of that would be political parties which basically formed after uh, yeah, uh, uh, electing representatives so in order to to get more efficiency out of that you would have uh, internal elections for people you would put up for certain positions yeah mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Well, there's, um, I mean, but the solution I would propose would be would be basically twofold. The first, the first element would be core centralized, distributed, and accepted value hierarchies that are, at, if if not identical, at least compatible with one another, mm -hmm. that are are broadly distributed throughout the society. If the society can agree upon a basic core value hierarchy, that is isn't excellent mechanism to establish long-term stability. And then the secondary element would be to align the incentives of the power structure such that they reinforce the value hierarchy. I agree. It, yeah, it, as a framework, I agree. But um, but in, in trying to systematize it, you you create the um, the grounds for its own for its own destruction somewhere down the line. So you're probably going to get maybe a few generations of success out of that, and then it'll start deteriorating. That's, I think that's well, part I of the mean, problem. You have to have it be completely, I, I, com completely focused on um, on either being ungameable or being, um, well, a completely closed system would be would be one way of, of going about it because there's no way for anybody outside to you know game the system if there is no possibility of anyone moving in from outside of the system at all. And that would be that would be one way of doing it. But anything that is trying to bring in new blood on any particular metric is going to be uh, running into problems of people gaming it. Well, the, that's that's why you set up the the uh, incentive structure such that gaming the system, gaming the system as such, actually uh, reinforces the hierarchy and the value structure. If you want to game the system, the most efficient and effective way to game the system is to support the hierarchy, to support the value structure. Any other ways uh, or attempts made to game the system would be less effective. Therefore, gaming the system reinforces the value hierarchy. Now, how to practically go about doing that, uh, the, I don't know off the top of my head, but there's been uh, a lot of uh, work done throughout history in political science and philosophy to come up with ways to incentivize people to act according to value systems. So 
that would just require someone to synthesize that and, and then get a society to buy into a value hierarchy that had that at the top. Which, again, that was no small feat. Perhaps I'm misunderstanding what you mean, but it sounds very much like um, a similar argument could be made for, for the kind of democracy that we have where you're electing a representative and you could say that the, the most effective way of getting, of getting elected is just being competent. But, but we would know that that's not actually the case because what's being selected for is not, is not competence, even though it, it's kind of what everyone claims it is, but it's actually it's, it's just more like just a popularity contest. So, so well, it is actually a lot yeah, more efficient right now, to, be, to be incompetent, but but affable, or, or, you know, but but charismatic. Yeah, the the, the current uh, election electoral system uh, values people who are capable of being elected. You know, it's it's. I, I realize that sounds like a tautology, and and it kind of is. So, what we need to do is we need to establish an election system that elects people based upon their competence to be, you know, running the government. How do you probably be? The problem would be how you how do you how, yeah how do you how do you measure that? Uh, by their adherence to the accepted value hierarchy of the society. It sounds like a purity test to join. I don't. I understand where you're going. I just I don't know how it would actually be implemented. In theory, I don't. I, I don't either. Sense, I mean, I, I, I'm just I'm telling you the the rules of the system. Yeah. In order for it to actually you know. If if you can find a system that would adhere to these rules, then it would be quote unquote ideal. It would be optimal. Now I'm not saying that I have such a system. I'm just saying that knowing that these are the limits within one can work, then one can start developing a system. And yes. that's what uh, the <laughs> the the founders of the US thought they were doing when they set the three branches of government against one another. Uh, yes, uh, they did, and look how <laughs> look how it went. I, I, I understand. I'm, I'm, and you know, same thing with the electoral college. They decide they tried to use natural um, uh, conflicts of interest, uh, assuming that the conflicts of interest would remain conflicts of interest, and rather than be aligned. So what they did was they created a system that um, selected for aligned interests across all of the various groups. So d would you consider that a demonstration that trying to have uh, powers keep each other in check is is demonstrably uh, impossible? Ineffective. <laughs> well, I wouldn't say it's impossible. I'd say it's ineffective. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But constitutionally, uh, probably impossible. But um, well, in so, in you so can have it's... different factions holding each other accountable, but not uh, you know as writ by constitution, I would say. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's yeah. That's what I was just going to say. Is that insofar as it's systematized, um, then you create the possibility of it, it breaking down somewhere down the line. I mean, it, it can break down at, at any time, but it tends to be a lot more um, stable, it, ironically, in some sense, um, when it's when it's inorganic. Oh, no, when it's organic rather rather than inorganic. Uh, so you have just um, a, a confluence of interests at any one time that is keeping whatever other power in in check in, in a kind of like continual negotiation sort of fashion and that's probably that's something that's going to come up um next time i, I suspect uh, based on the uh, the article that we've got lined up for next time yeah yeah we could we could carry this on for quite a while but let's yeah. let's carry on with the video <laughs> indeed we're, we're let's, trying let's to uh, establish <laughs> establish an ideal government system i feel like this this is probably a little bit too big a subject uh, for this video you put the question now here's your chance to answer it, Mr. Huxley. Well, this is obviously, first of all, the question of education. Uh, I think it's uh, terribly important to uh, insist on individual values. I mean, what is, uh, there is a tendency, as um, you probably read a book by White, The Organization Man, a very interesting, valuable book, I think, where he speaks about the new type of group morality, group ethic, which, uh, speaks about the group as though the group were somehow more important than the individual. But uh, this seems, as far as I'm concerned, to be uh, in contradiction with uh, what we know about the genetical makeup of human beings, that every human being is unique. And it is, of course, on this uh, genetical basis that the whole idea of the value of freedom is based. And I think it's extremely important for us to express this in all our educational life. And I would say it's also very important to 
teach people to be on their guard against the sort of verbal booby traps into which they're always being laid, uh, to, to analyze the kind of things that are said to them. Uh, well, I think there is this whole educational side, of, and I think there are many more things that one could do to, to strengthen uh, people and to make them more aware of what was being done. You're a prophet of decentralization. Well, the, yes, uh, if this is feasible, uh, it's one of the tragedies, it seems to me. I mean, many people have been talking about the importance of decentralization in order to give back to the voter a, a sense of direct power. I mean, uh, the voter in an enormous electorate feels quite impotent and his vote seems to count for nothing. This is not true where the electorate is small and where he is dealing with a with a, a group which he can manage and understand. And if one can, as Jefferson, after all, suggested, break up the units uh, into smaller and smaller uh, units and so get a real self-governing democracy. Well, that was all very well in Jefferson's day, but how can we revamp well, our economic system and decentralize and at the same time meet militarily and economically the, the, the tough challenge of a country like Soviet Russia. Well, I think uh, the, the answer to that is that there are, uh, it seems to me that you, uh, the production, industrial production is of two kinds. I mean, there are some kinds of industrial production which obviously need the most tremendously high centralization, like the making of automobiles, for example. But there are many other kinds where you could decentralize quite easily and probably quite economically and that you would then have uh, this kind of decentralized life. After all, you begin to see it now if you travel through the South, this uh, decentralized uh, uh, textile industry which is springing up there. Mr. Huckler, let me ask you this, quite seriously. It's, uh, it's, it's only slightly tangential uh, to that, but um, I think there's another good example of that, that idea of decentralization, particularly in the, um, in the framing of industrialization in the uh, some of the some elements of the Japanese war industry, because obviously they, because they had um, of all of the powers in World War Two, I think they pretty much they'd um, industrialized the most recently, and so they still had a lot of elements of um, sort of cottage industry, and so one of the ways that they ended up manufacturing as many aircraft as they did was by uh, utilizing some of this cottage industry, as in you know literally people in their houses who had specialized equipment to to create one particular part. Uh, for one particular plane and they would just do that repeatedly and then have those transported off and then between you know however many thousand of those of those types of um manufacturing houses there were um they would they would transport them all to one factory and then the uh, the aircraft would be assembled there uh, and i think that is another way of uh, of looking at things like industrialization uh, through and uh, through the lens of decentralization versus centralization that you can um, kind of play around with and look at different potential potential outcomes because I, the, when we tend to think about and discuss industrialization it does tend to be down this this very centralized route and yeah. uh, obviously that has certain consequences for the way that power is uh, is shifted in society and so I think based on based on the fact that it empowers certain people um, you know there might be a reason why we only view it as having there being or, or what, there might be a reason linked there uh, as to why we only view industrialization as having one possible avenue, but there, there are a lot of different ways that you can go about it and uh, achieve a lot of the same benefits, like you know specialization of labor and uh, economies of scale and all that kind of thing. Yeah, well, I think that the the connection comes about because there seems to be a. Uh, in most people's minds, a, a correlation between efficiency and and centralization. Uh, which obviously demonstrably isn't always true, but I I do I, th I do think that that's a common uh, conception, and <clears throat> th this whole section is one of the one of the parts that interests me the most because it's something that I've been bumping up again for for a little while. Um, you know the kind of federalization, the the Hopper view of a thousand Lichtensteins and, and and all of that kind of world view uh, is appealing to me, but. There is a balancing act, and I think that particularly with the U.S. in in the current current time, um, with talks of secession about, um, though I don't see them going through. Um, there, there, there is. There's discussions to be had about 
the limits of centralization, which we're all having, and you know, we all know that there is a limit, uh, whereas there are some people <laughs> at the moment that seem to believe that there is no limit to centralization. Um, but the other discussion that we must have on the flip side is if there are limits to decentralization, um, not, not out of any moral principle of decentralization, but out of practicality, um, how, how small can these communities be without inevitably being swallowed up and and still being able to to sustain right this uh, dovetails very well with uh, with the last conversation that we had on uh, geoeconomics because yeah. a thousand east india companies would not would not have survived exactly yeah yeah and i don't well, i don't know the... if there is an answer I, I i think that the pendulum will swing and uh if you live in if you live in the good times then great but if not there's going to be a waxing and waning of the sizes of state well, one of the core requirements of centralization is standardization, and you know, the, the to to your point about the the Japanese manufacturer of parts and assembly, if you know the 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 specialists were manufacturing parts that were all generally the same but not sufficiently within standards, they would not be able to be assembled uh, together effectively in the factory. So there's a, there's a core component of standardization that needs to be present in order for transmission of value between the groups. So uh, that's one of the reasons why I, I keep falling back to a common basic value hierarchy, because if that's shared and nothing else is shared, then communication and value transmission can occur between the, you know, the atomic groups. But the, the more, in line those two value hierarchies have to become because the the more centralization there is the more intrusive the government has to be uh that's that's one of the core reasons why cities and and uh the country have such disparities in uh, the freedoms allowed in the country it doesn't matter if if, if everyone's living on 150 acres it doesn't matter if they're shooting, you know, guns off at all hours of the night. They're never going to hit any of their neighbors, and their neighbors can barely hear them. But if you know they're all living with 150 square feet of one another, then darn right, not everybody can shoot guns whenever the heck they feel like it. Because not only are they going to be hitting one another all the time, they're going to be making so much noise, no one can sleep. Well, you're inherently going to run into problems of, um, well, mental and psychological. Uh isolation and such because we're very social social creatures so i don't think that's tenable to, to be that atomized in the first place so you're, you're kind of inevitably going to see that kind of homogenization but it's it's partially dependent on the extent of homogenization that you want to push because there are, there are certain sort of natural limits without without additional supplementing technologies like technologies of communication that allow you to you know, connect with people beyond let's say walking distance uh uh, that's true as far as it goes. Um, I would uh, suggest reading some Asimov about the uh, the spacers, because that was a society that was built uh, around the concept of individual atomic units. Without any communication with one another? Uh, fundamentally, yes. I think they, they were very, uh, very isolated. Doesn't that drive so. people to suicide quite quickly? <laughs> Look around you. It is. <laughs> yeah. I, that, I, I, I just, there's, there's a lot of, uh, background depth that was gone into in that series, uh, which is a part of the iRobot series. So I, it's, it's beyond the scope of, I think what we're prepared to dedicate to now. Fair enough. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not, uh, I'm not well versed on that series. Right. Uh, let's, Let's, let's see if we can finish this off. Unless there's any other comments to, to be had on that. No, no. As far as I'm concerned, it is, yes. Well, is it necessary for a productive society? Uh, yes, I, I should say it is. I mean, a, a, a genuinely productive society. I mean, I think you could produce plenty of goods without much freedom. But I, I think the whole sort of creative... Uh, life of man is ultimately impossible without a considerable measure of uh, individual freedom of uh, initiative, creation, all these things which we value, and I think value uh, properly, are impossible without a, a large measure of freedom. Well, Mr. Huxley, take a look again at 
the country which is in the stance of our opponent anyway it would seem anyway it would seem to be there soviet russia it is strong and getting stronger economically militarily at the same time it's developing its art forms pretty well uh, it seems not unnecessarily to uh, to squelch the creative urge among its people and yet it is not a free society it's not a free society uh, it's something very interesting that the it, it, uh, I have to disagree with the interviewer here as well. I, uh, we know from, we know that uh, quite a lot of uh, artists and writers were suppressed in uh, in communist regimes. So uh, it, it it does seem that that the more uh, managed a society is, the less uh, space there is for creativity. And you see the same thing in in companies where you have um, a startup. You have a lot of creative people, and at some point, startup gains a direction and all the creative people leave and all the managers they take over and they uh, they start taking this company in a more optimized different direction and that goes I, back to the standardization argument and you know the, the yeah, it, it, consolidation standard, the standardization is 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 making the system more efficient but by mm -hmm. forcing everybody to adhere to the same standard, the, the person who's really creative might come up with a new radical ID is, is kind of suppressed because what he produces is actually a hindrance to the optimized system. But what he produces might be the answer which you would need tomorrow to solve a new problem. Mm -hmm. which, goes, which, which, for, which also goes back to the people who were making steel during the Bronze Age or iron during the Bronze Age. They might be the creative people have found something new, but they haven't found a market yet. There would, so the, the problem which might utilize the solution has not been encountered yet. And that's but, why they need to use propaganda. Uh, <laughs> yep. To Pro convince people that the Bronze iron sword is propaganda. much better than the bronze sword. <laughs> Probably paid off the sea people to raid their own people or something. There's, like a, there's an old uh, uh, Mitchell and Webb clip of something similar to that, if I remember correctly. Uh, I mean, to an extent, though. So, sorry, sorry. I thought you were going to carry on. I was just going down a stupid rabbit hole. <laughs> okay. Um, well, there there is a uh, an extent to which that is that is the case because it, it was partially driven, as far as I can tell, by um, by fashions. And so, as soon as the top level of society basically went away or was replaced by another top level of society, it stopped being fashionable to be covered in so much bronze, and all of the effort became a lot more uh, unnecessary. Probably, at. Well, well, isn't fashion used by um, oh gosh, what is his name? Uh, who wrote uh, propaganda? Bernays. Um, isn't fashion used by him as like a preliminary example of uh, how propaganda can be used? I'm, I'm not sure of the I'm not sure of the exact example, but yes, I would definitely I would definitely agree. If I remember correctly, he, he uses uh, the people that influence fashion as one of the prime examples for how we've historically seen uh, propaganda in use. Yeah, you would say he's a fashionist. <laughs> <laughs> Those members of the society, like the scientists who are doing the creative work, are given far more freedom than anybody else. I mean, it's a privileged aristocratic society in which, provided that they don't poke their noses into political affairs, these people are given a great deal of prestige, a considerable amount of freedom, and a lot of money. I mean, uh, this is a very interesting fact about the new uh, Soviet regime. And I think what we're going to see uh, is a, a, a people on the whole with very little freedom, but with an oligarchy on top enjoying a considerable measure of freedom and a very high standard of living. And the people down below, the epsilons down below... Enjoying very little. And you think that that kind of situation can long endure? I think it can certainly endure much longer than a situation in which everybody is, uh, is kept down. I mean, they can certainly get uh, their technological and scientific results on such a basis. Well, the next time that I talk to you then... Wouldn't that be terrible? Should investigate first. It's endured for a, uh, a year and a half already. So, yeah. <laughs> is, is he, um, is, is, he's basically talking about a middle class of scientists who get money and the resource to do stuff. 
Well, I think he's talking about the transition of of there being a middle class to there just being a uh, an, ol- an oligarchy and uh, and the epsilons below. I, I I think in in his description, it's just uh, just alphas and just epsilons because you can get to a position if you. Uh, Using Brave New World as the example, if you technologically innovate, you don't even need uh, betas down to gammas. You, all you need is group a large group of epsilons and uh, and the alphas to enjoy it. Yeah, in, but in that society, politics basically was reduced to one single person, which was the world controller. So he was the the political elite, and the rest just didn't bother with politics. They just assumed that it was true. But I wonder how how yeah. much you could stay, <laughs> how much you could stay away from politics in the in the Soviet Union. Oh, I'm not talking about the Soviet Union. <laughs> I'm talking about now. No, no, but Huxley is. So they're they're kind of talking about the the image that they had of the Soviet Union as the the the, the big enemy uh, that was a uh, economic colossus. Uh, a kind which kind of itself was a bit of a propaganda image from the from the US itself. Yeah. So with your question just then, sorry, um, putting it to the to Soviet Russia, how, how easy could you live in Soviet Russia without r- running against the, uh, without coming into contact with the state? I think that would be very hard. Hmm. So especially, especially during Stalin's days where you could get gulag for uh, picking up grains from, uh, from the field after harvesting. Or putting your your coat on a on a statue of Lenin. Do you think you're more likely to come into contact with the states now in just England or America? Tweet, tweeting the wrong thing. Yeah, I think I think I think I think it's the same, but you have to take into account that the population density is a lot higher right now. So. Hmm. Hmm. We've gotten into this this kind of nanny state where everybody expected that the state will solve all problems for you, so that then that will justify having a bigger state, an ever closer union, and uh, but it will also mean that 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 there will be a bureaucrat between everything you do at some point. Mm. Are there the possibility of the establishment of that kind of a society? Where the, where the drones work for the queen bees up above. Well, but yes, but um, I must say, I still believe in democracy. If we can make the best of, uh, of the creative activities of the people on top, plus those of the people on the bottom, so much the better. Mr. Huxley, I surely thank you for spending this half hour with us, and I wish you Godspeed, sir. Thank you. Aldous Huxley finds himself these days in a peculiar and disturbing position. A quarter of a century after prophesying an authoritarian state in which people were reduced to ciphers, he can point at Soviet Russia and say, I told you so. The crucial question, as he sees it now, is whether the so-called free world is shortly going to give Mr. Huxley the further dubious satisfaction of saying the same thing about us. And the answer is... Uh, well, I'm reminded of that uh, that Venn diagram of uh, of all the different dystopias. Uh, <laughs> you are here. You are right in the middle. <laughs> the, the the last dystopia I thought that we actually would be in would be the Hunger Games, but here we are. Here we are. Here we are. <laughs> well, I mean, arguably, uh, it's not a dystopia. <laughs> Depends on Tec- where you are. Technically, it's not a dystopia. Yeah. I mean, uh, uh, again, that it's a question of value hierarchies. If the optimal and the ideal, as Mustafa Mann said, uh, is human happiness, they pretty much nailed it. No, they didn't. What, what do you mean? Do you mean they did, or in a brave new world? In, in, brave, in brave new, brave world, new no. world. Yeah. Yeah. So, so like, if, except for for the few alphas who were allowed to uh, to have free free reign, because they also they always needed some radicals for some unknown problem, but uh, the rest of them were basically cattle. Very munetic. munetic. <laughs> <laughs> right. Let's uh, let's finish this off and then wrap up. 
Stay tuned for a preview of next week's interview. Till then, Mike Wallace, good night. Good night. Oh, well, yeah, there really wasn't much to finish off there. <laughs> um, yes, what do we think? I, I, any final thoughts? Uh, I, I think it was good to to have a discussion on this. Uh, there's a lot to a lot to cover and a lot that's still re- relevant today, and some that's perhaps more relevant now than it was when he was talking about it. Yes, I think he, well. So I, I hold to the view that he was honest but naive. Um, mm-hmm. And like you said earlier, um, you lean more towards the fact that he's not kind of uh, showing his hand, which, yeah, I mean, I, I could be either, but um, it does seem like he's he's not giving the proper acknowledgement to the uh, the lens that he's inhabiting, rather the rather just using it to uh, observe other other societies and point out their flaws or point out the tra- the trajectory that we might be on, rather than the trajectory that we are already on. If you know what I mean, Mina. Yes, yeah. I, I my 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 view is is somewhat changed on that purely for his defense of democracy. Um because if he is if he is aware and hiding his the knowledge of uh, his self-reflection. Um I don't know, he he comes across as very sincere when he defends democracy and I I would think if he was um able to be so self-aware he would he would know the the issues with democracy and wouldn't be such a fervent uh, supporter of it. So I'm not sure. Uh, impossible to know now, but uh, valuable to listen to him nonetheless. We don't have television like this uh, anymore. And that might also be the reason why, why a lot of people have tuned out. Well, look at us. We're having to watch a, uh, 60 year old interview to find something of substance <laughs> well it is it is amusing that uh, somebody pointed out recently how some of the some of the images that are used as uh, a sort of sort of nostalgic pieces um of you know remember what they took from us that kind of thing are are literally just advertisements from bygone years yeah. there's a certain irony to that i think Yeah, there's definitely a skewed um, traditionalism, a faux traditionalism, which is based on <laughs> material, um, materialistic tradition. Nostalgia goals, or yeah, and just I don't know. Take a this is a tangent to go off at the end, but just for as an example. The Irish nationalism of 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 America is is put on a green hat and drink some Guinness and uh, you know wave wave a four leaf clover around. You know, <laughs> this is this is the kind of traditionalism that people are being spoon fed now. It's buy a product that's branded with an Irish theme on it, as opposed to anything deeper. A bag of green M and M's. <laughs> well, again, Mustafa Mann said uh, there's no point in searching for deeper meaning. We're happy with happiness. Hmm. Well, let's, uh, <laughs> let's wrap it up. <laughs> oh, that's there, your whole note. <laughs> no. uh, unless there's anything else that anyone wants to say. I think that's pretty much it from me. Yeah, yeah. I'm also. Uh... Well, Thanks, uh, thanks for for watching, and we shall see you again in a couple of weeks' time, uh, where we'll be most likely looking at an essay. Uh, but uh, for now, we shall see you later. Goodbye. Bye. Take care. Thanks a lot.